Uh, okay, uh, well thank you for the introduction and I wanna thank the organizers for inviting me to speak here. It's a r really a great pleasure. Um, so as you'll see in this talk, a lot of the, uh, the work in this talk and a lot of my other work has been sort of inspired by work of Gordon and, and his collaborators. Um, so it's a special honor to, to speak here. Okay. Uh, so the main themes I'm gonna talk about uh, are joint with Spencer Leslie. So I'm gonna start with something very classical, uh, the classical theta function. So it's got some Q expansion. Theta of Z is Q to the N squared. So one plus two times the sum of Q to the N squared for N at least one. Uh, where of course Q is e to the two pi I Z. So this is a classical modular form of weight one half for the group gamma one four, which I'll put in SL2 here. So this is the congruent subgroup of SL2 of matrices A, B, C, D, such that uh, this is congruent to one star zero one mod four. So what I'm gonna do is take this uh, modular form of weight one half and cube it and call this some new modular form. So this new modular form has a particularly nice Fourier expansion. So it's a sum of Q to the N1 squared over N1 and Z times Q to the N2 squared times uh, Q to the N3 squared over n2 and over n3, which when we multiply this out is uh, the Fourier coefficients, uh, count the number of ways we can represent n as the sum of three squares. So this r3 of n is uh, the size of the sets n1, n2, n3, and z cubed such that n1 squared plus n2 squared plus and three squared is equal to n. So the miraculous thing is that these representation numbers R3 of n uh, tell you about class numbers of imaginary quadratic fields. So theorem, and this is due to Gauss, suppose n is at least four uh, congruent to one or two mod four and square free, then R3 of N is 12 times the size of the class group of Q adjoined square root minus N. Okay, um, and so I've called this modular form E sub CZ because uh, Cohen and Zagier, they studied this modular form from the point of view of Eisenstein series. Studied E. Cohen Zagier from a uh, perspective of Eisenstein series. So what I wanna do in this talk is tell you about an analog of this modular form ECZ. So this talk, an analog of ECZ to the group G2. Okay. Uh, so first I wanna give uh, another way of defining this modular form, which will sort of motivate how we might get an analog to G2. Okay, so another way. So let me denote H3, the so-called Ziegel upper half space. So this is the Z and uh, three by three complex matrices that are symmetric and whose imaginary part is positive definite. So this is the symmetric space for SP6R. 
So SP6R mod denotated with U3. And I can put a theta function on uh, for the double cover of SP6, uh, or in other words, on this uh, Hermitian symmetric space. So theta SP6 of Z defined to be the sum of e to the 2 pi i uh, v z transpose v, where v is n1, n2, n3, is an element of z cubed. Okay, so this is the classical uh, Ziegel modular theta function. So it's a weight one half, classical weight one half, uh, Ziegel modular form. So if I restrict um, this theta sp6 to a diagonally embedded SL2, we can recover uh, this modular form E sub CZ. So theta sp6 restricted to ZZZ. This is the sum of E to the 2 pi I uh, V transpose V times Z, where V is in Z cubed which is R3 of n, Q to the n, and only zero, this special modular form. Okay, so in other words, what have we done? Uh, we've looked at the double cover of SP6, and we consider in the, in the double cover of SP6 the dual pair of SL2 times the compact SO3, so the G in SL3, as that transpose G times G as the identity. And we put the theta function uh, uh, on this double cover SP6, and we restricted it to SL2. And all of a sudden, when we do that, we get this, uh, this sort of modular form E cohen Zage that has these Fourier coefficients um, that are class numbers of imaginary quadratic fields. So uh, there's a, a second diagram that sort of looks just like this one. And you have the double cover of F4. And this is a double cover. And a dual pair of the double cover of G2 uh, times SO3, the same SO3. Okay, so the SP6 sits inside of F4, the SO2 sits inside of G2, and the SO3 is equal to this SO3. Split that four, thank you, yes. Uh, so this F4 and the G2 are split. Okay. So uh, the double cover of F4 has an odd work of minimal representation. So let me write theta F4 uh, for a vector, some sort of special vector in the automorphic minimal representation. Uh, of F4 of the Adels. So this was uh, constructed, uh, constructed uh, by Loke and Savin, and sort of further studied by Ginsburg, David Ginsburg. And so I can do that. We can put uh, some sort of special vector in this automorphic minimal representation on F4, and we can restrict it to G2. Let me put it on this board. All right, theta G2 to be the restriction of this theta F4 to G2. And so now I can tell you uh, what the main result will be. So theorem. So first, There exists a notion of modular forms of 
of half integral weight on the double cover of G2. So these are special automorphic forms, uh, which generalize the modular forms of integral weight on G2 that we just heard about in Rahul's talk. So these modular forms, uh, they have a semi-classical notion of Fourier expansion and Fourier coefficients. Notion of Fourier expansion. And Fourier coefficients. Okay, so the integral weight modular forms in G2 that Rahul was talking about, they have a, a notion of Fourier expansion and Fourier coefficients, and then the same thing turns out to be true for these half integral weight guys. This special function theta G2, that comes from the automorphic minimal representation of F4 restricted to G2. Uh, so this is such an object. This is a modular form of weight one half on G2. Oops, I skipped two. Uh, and then three, which is the most interesting part, it's Fourier coefficients. Are related to, so instead of uh, class groups of imaginary quadratic fields, it turns out to be uh, two torsion in the class groups of totally real cubic fields. Uh, class, class two for totally real cubic fields. Okay, so this class group plus, this is the, the so-called narrow class groups. That's where you take, um, uh, principal, you take fractional uh, OE ideals and you might out by principal ideals that have a totally positive generator. Okay, so my goal for the talk is mostly to sort of um, describe, tell you what, uh, to make this theorem more precise, to tell you what the, the words mean and and what the, what the main result is. So I'm, fortunately, I'm fortunate that I get to talk after Rahul because he already told you a bit about modular forms on G2. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about them a little bit, uh, maybe from a slightly different perspective. Um, so these were defined and sort of first studied uh, by uh, Dick Gross and Nolan Wallach and uh, Don Gross and Savin. Uh, so as Rahul was saying, there are automorphic forms associated to um, let me leave myself some space. Um, automorphic representations, pi equals pi f times pi infinity on G2 of the Adels. With this pi infinity, the Archimedean component, a quaternionic discrete series. And so what I want to say is that they're associated to uh, the minimal K type of pi infinity. Uh, with uh, such an automorphic representation. And they behave similarly to classical uh, holomorphic modular forms even though the symmetric space for G2 uh, so G2 of R minus maximal compact subgroup uh, is not Hermitian. Okay.
So recall, the maximum convex subgroup of G2, of G2 of R, what does it look like? Uh, it's SU2 times SU2 mod a diagonal mu2. So I'm gonna define for you these modular forms on, of integral weight on G2 in a sort of semi-classical way. Um, so this, this group, uh, maximal compact of G2, it acts on a representation which I wanna call VL, which is symmetric to Lth power of the standard representation and this is my long root SU2, this is the, the long root SU2, and this is the short root SU2. Tensor the trivial representation of the short root SU2. And so you'll note that um, in order for this plus or minus one to act trivially, I needed to take uh, two L symmetric power of the first SU2 if I wanted to put a trivial representation on the second SU2. That's why this is called VL as opposed to V2L. So definition. Modular form on G2 of weight L. So I'll just give you a sort of a semi-classical definition of integral weight L. is an automorphic function. B from G2 of R uh, mod some congruent subgroup to this representation VL such that uh, two properties are satisfied. B of GK is K inverse B of G for all K in the maximal compact subgroup. And two, some differential equation is satisfied. So DL of phi is identically zero, where DL is a certain uh, linear first order differential operator. Okay, so if you prefer the, um, the sort of the quaternion discrete series way of looking at things, uh, if you have an automorphic embedding of one of these representations and you restrict it to the minimal k-type, uh, you get, uh, and then you sort of change things into semi-classical language, you get an object like this. It satisfies, um, maybe I should just put here as remark, Yes, yeah, so I'm assuming that when I say automorphic function. Yes. Do you absolutely want to put a function? Uh, so let me just write a remark. So BL, which is self dual, is the minimal K type of the representation that Rahul was calling pi L from Rahul's talk. So, so that's what the, uh, these quaternionic modular forms are. And now I told you that they have a notion of Fourier coefficients and Fourier expansion. The next one to tell you what that is. So modular forms on G2 have Fourier coefficients. So this uh, goes back to work of Wallace and Don Gross and Savin, and the form in which I'll describe it, I worked out a few years ago. Um, so uh, you take the group G2, and inside of G2, you take the Heisenberg parabolic subgroup, Heisenberg. So this is the parabolic subgroup with Levy M and unipin radical N, where M is isomorphic to GL2, and N is the two-step nilpotent radical of, of G2. So N contains um, its commutator subgroup, which I'll call Z, with 
z one dimensional and n mod z as a representation of the levy m is the symmetric cube representation of GL2 with a determinant twist. Okay, so let's say I have an arbitrary automorphic function uh, on G2, so some arbitrary automorphic function. I can take its constant term uh, along the, this highest root space Z, so this is the highest root space, and it's equal to the constant term of phi along uh, the uniform radical n plus some Fourier expansion. Phi chi of g, where chi is in uh, the Pondragon dual of, I'll just write this sort of semi-classically, n of r mod n of z times z of r, the dual of that. Okay, so uh, chi here is, is such a character. So um, this Pontryagin dual, you can identify with integral binary cubic forms. So the set of a u cubed plus b u squared d plus c u v squared plus d v cubed with a b c d integers. Oops. Uh, it's a constant term of phi along z. So phi z, and this is the constant term of phi along z, and similarly for phi n, constant term of phi along n. Okay. Okay, so before I tell you exactly what the, uh, the Fourier expansion looks like, I want to make a definition. The definition. Uh, suppose f of uv is such an integral binary, or just a real binary cubic, a real binary cubic. Then I write f is at least zero, and say f is positive semi-definite. If f factors Uh, into three linear terms, three linear pieces over R. Okay, as opposed to a linear term and a quadratic term. Okay. So the Fourier expansion of uh, these quaternionic modular forms is uh, a refinement of this sort of general Fourier expansion of an arbitrary automorphic function. And it turns out only the positive semi-definite uh, binary cubics contribute. Okay, so theorem. Suppose L at least one is fixed. Uh, there exists completely explicit uh, functions. Uh, suppose L is fixed and F at least zero is a real binary cubic. There exists completely explicit functions WF one for each such f from G2 of R to this representation VL of the maximal convex subgroup, satisfying a few different properties. So one, WF of GK is K inverse applied to WF of G for all K and K. Uh, two, WF of ng, where n is in the unipotent radical of the highest moon parabolic, is chi f of n 
W f of G for all N in the unipotent radical of the highest moment parabolic, where chi F is the character of N uh, corresponding to F, where chi F uh, corresponds to F. Three, they're annihilated by this differential operator W uh, DL, w, DL of WF is identically zero. And then the important part, uh, which follows from the first three, is that if phi is a, a modular form on G2 of weight L, then uh, the constant term of phi along Z is the constant term of phi along N plus a sum of these completely explicit functions, W of G times some Fourier coefficients, A phi of F. F is an integral binary cubic that's positive semi-definite. Okay, and so these, um, these A phi of Fs are called the Fourier coefficients of, of phi. So A phi of F are the Fourier coefficients. And they are complex numbers, thank you. Okay. So, uh, so theorem, or I'm not going to, we'll see how much time I have, but um, this theorem uh, essentially generalizes to the double cover of G2. So I'll essentially generalizes to the double cover of G2. So I'm gonna tell you just a, a little bit about this. So the, the fundamental group the, in the usual topological sense of G2 of R is uh, Z mod two. So um, there exists uh, a double cover, G2 tilde. And it's got a uh, central mu two. And let me let uh, K G2 tilde be the inverse image in this double cover of the maximal compact subgroup, my fixed maximal compact subgroup KG2 of G2. So this KG2 tilde is just an SU2 times SU2 with no diagonal mu2 plotted out. So I just want to uh, say a little bit about um, what these modular forms on the double cover of G2 are, these half and weight modular forms. Okay. The definition. Suppose L is a half integer, so it's one half plus an integer, and let me assume that it's not negative. And suppose gamma inside of G2 is a congruence inside of G2 of R, is a congruence subgroup. That's equipped with a splitting. So gamma sits inside uh, of G2 of R, which receives a map from this double cover of G2, and suppose I'm giving a given a splitting uh, of gamma into the double cover. So a modular form of weight L 
on G2, double cover, and level gamma comma S gamma is now what you'd expect given the previous definition, an automorphic function C from the double cover of G2 mod gamma uh, split into the double cover to uh, VL. So this is sin to the 2L of C squared tensor of the trivial representation as a representation of uh, this KG2 tilde, the inverse image in uh, KG2 in the double cover. So it's SU2 times SU2. So L is a half integer, so 2L is an integer, an odd integer. Uh, that satisfies uh, one, V of GK is K inverse V of G for all K in KG2 tilde, and two, some differential equation is satisfied. VL of phi is identically zero. So theorem modular forms on G2 double cover of half integral weight uh, so this is to dispenser and myself have semi-classical Fourier expansion and Fourier coefficients. Uh, so basically everything works out uh, exactly as in this result here, except there's one twist. The Fourier coefficients uh, with one difference with the, with the integral weight case. And the difference is that the Fourier coefficients a phi of f, the Fourier coefficients, instead of being complex numbers, they're complex numbers modulo plus or minus one. So uh, what happens is that, uh, I, I guess I don't want to rewrite everything I just wrote on the, uh, on the double covered side, but what happens is that instead of finding, uh, if you just take this theorem and say L is a half integer, the theorem is that there are completely explicit functions WF1 and WF2 that are negatives of each other and that satisfy these properties. And so we can't sort of pick out uh, a single such, when you can pick out a single function WF, you get these Fourier coefficients which are complex numbers, uh, but we can only pick out a pair of two functions that are negatives, negatives of each other um, that satisfy these properties. And so instead of getting complex number Fourier coefficients, we get Fourier coefficients that are complex numbers modulo plus or minus one. Below plus or minus one, all, like, all at the same time. So uh, maybe I'll just write that. Um, so the theorem is that there are functions WF1 and WF2 that satisfy these properties together with the additional property four that WF2 is a negative of WF1. And then if you have an automorphic function, a modular form P on G2, you can take this Fourier expansion and for each F you have to choose one of either WF1 or WF2, so I put an I there, and then you get a Fourier coefficient that depends upon which choice you make, and if you pick WF2 as opposed to WF1, the Fourier coefficient is the negative of, uh, of what you would get. But the way you phrase the theorem, you can always replace WF by some mm -hmm. multiple, and it's not completely rigid the way you phrase it. And so, if you, that's right, uh, so, so if WF satisfies this, these properties, and so does any multiple of it, um, but there's a particular choice, that's sort of why I say completely explicit. Uh, so there's a particular choice. So you can make other choices, but it's so explicit that it's sort of suggested that there's uh, a best one. And, and then you get such a result. But then on the double coverage G2, instead of being one obvious choice, there's sort of two obvious choices. Oh, 
like you know, in our paper we were just doing level one forms. In particular, this uh, gamma contains n of z. I mean, yeah. the, 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 we assume that. Uh, so just for the purpose of exposition for the talk, I mean, I, I'm assuming gamma contains n of z, so I can talk about say integral binary cubic. But you wouldn't care. Even, yeah, for, not, even for linear case, you can tell it's just, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's just for the purpose of the. Okay. Uh, let me pull this. Okay. Um, So that's what uh, module forms on G2 are, and what module forms on the double cover are, and what the Fourier expansion looks like. So there's Fourier coefficients. And so now I can tell you uh, what the Fourier coefficients are of this special module form on the double cover of G2 that we can construct. So I told you before that they were um, related to the two torsion in the uh, narrow class groups of totally real cubic fields, and so now I'm going to tell you more precisely what they are. Okay. So suppose E is a totally real cubic field. Totally real cubic field. And R is some order in E. So I'm going to make a sort of an algebraic construction that depends upon R, and um, this, this algebraic construction is sort of uh, gonna be what the Fourier coefficients are. It's gonna be related to the Fourier coefficients. So, um, so let QR be roughly speaking, so roughly QR, the square roots of the inverse different of R in the narrow class group of E. So that's sort of a rough definition. And now let me tell you more precisely. Precisely, I uh, make a definition of what are called balanced pairs. So suppose I comma mu is a pair of a fractional R ideal That's the I, uh, and mu is a totally positive element of E cross. So I'll just write E cross greater than zero. Uh, you say the pair is balanced if two conditions are satisfied. So one, mu times I squared is contained in the inverse different. And two, the norm of mu times the norm of i squared, the norm of i squared times the discriminant of the cubic ring R is equal to one. So if uh, R is the maximal order in E, these two conditions are exactly saying that mu times i squared is equal to the inverse difference. Um, so now I'm gonna put an equivalence relation on these pairs. So say I comma mu is equivalent to I prime mu prime if there exists some beta in the E cross, the totally real cubic field, such that uh, I prime is uh, beta times I and mu prime is beta to the minus two times mu. So, uh, mu times i squared is equal to mu prime times i prime squared, and the norm of mu times the norm of i squared is equal to the norm of i prime times the norm of mu prime squared. This is some sort of equivalence relation. And now finally, the set QR are defined to be a set of balanced pairs i comma mu, module of this equivalence relation. So these QRs are gonna turn out to be Fourier coefficients of a modular form on G2, double cover, or the sizes of these QRs. Um, so this set QR, it turns out to always be finite, always finite. 
and it's sometimes empty. So some corresponding Fourier coefficient would be zero in the case that it's empty. And moreover, so this is the case you should really think about, or the, the easiest to digest, if R is maximal, the maximal order in E, and QR is non-empty, then the size of QR, it's sort of easy to see, is four times this, the, the class group, the size of the two torsion of the narrow class group of E. Okay. So now I'll tell you the, the precise theorem. Theorem. So there exists theta G2, a modular form on G2 of weight one half. So I'm the double cover G2. Um, with, well, let me say, whose Fourier coefficients. include the numbers uh, plus or minus 24 times the size of QR. So I have to put a plus or minus because the Fourier coefficients, remember, are only defined up to multiplication by plus or minus one. Uh, for special sorts of cubic rings R, for R, what I'll call even monogenic. Okay. And the definition of even monogenic is that R is of the form Z adjoin Y mod Y cubed plus CY squared plus uh, BY plus A, where A, B, and C are even. Okay. Um, I think that's as good a place as any to stop, so I'll stop there.